details. And this is one of these stupid fucking moments where the guy who is a church-going, Christ-believing, crucifix-wearing guy whose entire fucking childhood home is just filled with Bible quotes and Jesus knickknacks decides to become a Christian. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Right. And also, he's like everyone who ever starts reading a Bible in a fucking Christian movie, he starts in like Psalms somewhere. Yep. Just right in the middle. Just flipping <laughs> through. Okay. <laughs> Jewish, 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 Jewish. <laughs> Here we go. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema so that we'll welcome death when it comes. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath And right, Heath, welcome back. Nothing happens in the movie, Noah. They <laughs> forgot to do their movie that they set up. Whatever. They start. They remembered the first act. Yes. And then after that, yeah. We're going to talk about them forgetting. Yes. And sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm incredible, Noah. I have discovered your cousin who won't stop talking about his whiplash, the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you remember my car accident in 2007. Yes, yeah, that man, I got you whiplash. told us about the goddamn yeah, fucking car accident. They, they, yes. they couldn't diagnose it. No, I know. I know you I told me this story whiplash. a number of... <laughs> An exotic whiplash. <laughs> so tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched I Can't Breathe, God Forgive Them. It's actually a fascinating look at the George Floyd story, but with a race reversal that really makes you think, you know, how would that go if it was a white guy? Also, it's not at all about George Floyd. I don't know sure exactly is how no, Eli got uh -uh. there. I think he, he read I Can't Breathe, the half title, and made the association, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you found yourself shocked as the American Christian persecution complex seems to have no bounds, but you'd like to hold their beer while they crawl under the bar of human decency, <laughs> you will love this movie. All right, so, and of course, a follow-up on what Heath was just saying that I think is necessary for the folks that maybe heard last week's What's on Deck. How bad was your description of this movie last week? Okay, okay, let me be clear. When I looked at the description... I thought this was a police brutality from the cop's perspective movie. Uh -huh. It is not. It's a white Christian guy going, wow, this time of generational upheaval and reckoning about the brutal execution of men of color with no trial is an excellent chance for me to talk about my invisible friend. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, right. Yeah. So in Eli's defense, we should point out that this movie's marketing goes out of its way to make you think it's about George Floyd. Right. Like, you know how, like, after Jennifer Aniston got big, they re-released Leprechaun, but with her on the cover. It's it's like that. But for institutionalized state violence against minorities. Yes. Oh, so a lot like Leprechaun. Actually, yeah. actually, now that you mention it. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> that reminds me the movie. <laughs> And is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I'm going to go with best worst stuff on the walls and just like Ooh. in the sets that they're trying to set up. They have no idea what any room is. Everything exists in like the mid 80s in terms of houses and offices. Mm -hmm. There's crazy things on the walls. There's actually a bunch of that like Michael's art bullshit on the walls. It's like they heard us making fun of that a few times recently and they're like, oh, yeah. Fuck you. The whole set is just live, <laughs> laugh, love, pray, Jesus, God, in like puzzle pieces on walls. Your notes were fascinating. I missed a lot of that stuff. <laughs> and perhaps it was because I was focused on mine. I'm going with best worst necktie. Yep. Holy fucking <laughs> shit. And nobody acknowledges it. It just hangs there in the middle of the movie as though it's a normal thing that a human would wear. If there was a penis hanging from this man's neck, less weird. <laughs> oh, a severed, a severed penis with a man behind him clutching his now desecrated <laughs> groin. Well, that would all make sense. In like Screaming the for the mercy right, of yeah, God. Right, yeah, exactly. I would tell a cohesive story yeah. on like this fucking time. <laughs> we'll get there. It's jarring. And I, of course, am going to go with best worst post-movie 
interview. Yes. <laughs> Listen, folks, I know there are some of you out there who watch these with us. And hey, this one's only 60 minutes. So definitely worth sinking your time into. It's 65 if you count the interview. You yeah, is, are going to want to wait for the ending where, well, you know, I'll, I'll leave. We'll get to it when we get to it. Just just trust me. Wait for the ending. Yeah. And, and don't worry about missing it, listener. There are zero seconds of credits before the post credit scene starts, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it, it is directly connected to the final scene of the movie, which doesn't seem like the final scene of a movie. So, nope. yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. This is a movie about police brutality against a douchey Christian day trader who can't stop bragging about how good he is at martial arts. So that's my other best, 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 best is when he does that. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like we're going to need a second to sort out our sympathies on this one. But we're going to be back in a flash with all the sub cinematic action of I Can't Breathe. Hi, I'm Heath Enright. I'm No Illusions. And I'm Eli Bosnick. You've been listening to our shows for a while. You know that Eli here is not the best with money. I mean, how was I supposed to know that NFTs weren't the museum of the future? Exactly. If your New Year's goals are to manage your budget better and save money, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. It's true. I use Rocket Money to manage my budget, cancel old subscriptions I forgot about, and they even help me switch my power and internet carriers to save me some money. That's right. And Eli is just one of the over 3 million people that have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. Yeah, that's almost half of what Eli lost on Bitcoin last year. Hey! Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost. He only invested a small amount. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. That's rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. Rocketmoney.com slash awful movies. Rocket money. Whenever I try to buy something on the bounce, it just doesn't. Nope. No, it does not. Tom, Tom, get in here. Hey, yes. What is it, my wife? Have you seen this terrible murder on the news? Oh, yeah? What happened? Well, thanks to the invention and common disbursement of cell phone cameras, we're once again witnessing the execution of unarmed black men. Whoa. I know. What a fantastic opportunity for white people to examine our privilege and, 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 and own the ways in which a violent police state has been used to oppress people of color in our country. Yeah, absolutely. Or... Uh, this is not the kind of thing you want to respond to with or... Or is it a chance to talk about how I found Jesus more extra? No, no, it is literally the worst time for you to talk about it. Oh, come on, honey. What are you talking about? Look at that. Their signs say I can't breathe and I couldn't breathe when those police officers killed it's, me. It's so not the time. Oh, but not just that. I think it can also talk about my real trial, my testicular cancer. Oh, so now it's literally just about you. It sure is. People will finally hear my story and my truth because I think we can all agree. You're too good at karate to have tried to fight those cops. I'm too good at karate to have tried to fight those cops. Exactly. Okay. And we're back for the breakdown and we're going to open on some excerpts from a court document. This is where we all first like slowly start to realize that this movie has nothing to do with George Floyd. Yeah. No, does not. And we get the thing that movies do where it's like the following is taken from actual court mm -hmm. documents and it's like being typed out on the screen. Why do all movies do this? Why is that happening on a typewriter in whatever movie universe? You think they do it on a computer it's now? Well, it's Florida. So, yeah, who knows? I was going to say explains how good they are at solving murders. Yeah, right, right. But yeah, no, the, and then the whole movie is like, I know we misled you to get here. We're not going to explain the title, but this is not a story about George Floyd. It's a white guy. It's a story about a white but guy. But it is. It is a story about a guy who said, I can't breathe. <laughs> yes. Once. Oh. Imagine the balls on a person to be like, we need to tell my white guy story of police brutality. That's what we're watching. Right. Yes. That wasn't a testicular cancer joke, by the way. I know if you've watched the movie, Heath was just, just a phrase that Heath uses. He's going to get cancer later. It's going to be great. He, he is going to get ball. ball cancer. Yeah. I hope he dies. And <laughs> then we cut 
from it's it was this weird kind of like because it's like you know this man died and they wouldn't let the ambulance in and blah blah, blah and it was very uh, you know police brutality da 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 and then we immediately cut to like these establishing upbeat shots of like the, living the high life in Miami. Yes, it's so jarring this switcheroo because it's like I can't breathe. I'm dying. Squirt in the nail. Welcome to the infinity <laughs> pool at Fontainebleau. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> sights of Miami Beach. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh God, I love cheap credits so much. I love it when the movie is so cheap that you look at the credits and you're like, "Oh, this is how bad they are at putting words over the images." Mm -hmm. This bodes well. We also learn here that this movie was produced and written by the guy it's based on. So we're like, "Oh, this is going to be very objective." The best of films. The best of films. We also learn that Kevin Sorbo is going to be in it. Yeah. Which is very exciting. Sure will. And terrifying. Bringing some star power to this thing. Right, exactly. To be clear, just for some context, Kevin Sorbo, I think, financed this thing, kind of like somehow got a letter from this guy and like decided yeah. to make his story into a movie. So just keep that in mind. Kev, this is the brainchild somewhat of Kevin Sorbo telling yep. the story of the white guy and his problem with the police. Of let there be light fame. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and the narrator cuts in. The narration on this was a great, like a best worst contender, right? Because the narrator in this movie is like, you ever watch a movie with an annoying guy who really likes that movie and he keeps saying shit like, Ooh, watch this part up here. Like, what do you think I was going to fucking do with this part up here? Right? <laughs> That's the narrator in this fucking movie. Wait, I was just going to listen this part. You say eyes to? <laughs> yeah, right. I watch it. So, so the narrator cuts in and he's like, you know, testing your faith is super duper important. The Bible's full of very moral stories that make that point. You know, like Abraham being told to murder his son or Joseph being sold into slavery. Those are his examples. Yep. Yikes. Those classic good stories that everyone agrees are not problems with this movie. Right. And of course, as the narrator saying this, we're watching him flirt with beautiful women and drink alcohol at a bar. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> almost my best worst. But it's just so many movies that we do can't get this shit right. The bartender gave one of these women, I'm saying woman, that's being generous. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no, okay. 14. One There's of them a is child. very clearly, thank you. One There's is a very child clearly a drinking child. drinking next to him. Yeah. The bartender gave this child a three foot long straw for a rocks glass drink and it's sticking out like three quarters of the thing is sticking out of the glass and at one point <laughs> she tries to drink out of it and actually pokes herself in the eye because yeah it's like a three foot long straw and they had to cut it's ridiculous <laughs> all right so then we cut from that we, we cut to these three cops watching security footage Right now, this is going to be Officer Murder and his two lackeys. Yeah. And I love they're, they're, the room that they're in is smoke filled, even though nobody's smoking. It's just like this problem. This room would probably have smoke in it. It would be ominous, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and so Tom, who this movie is about, Tom imagines that there were three police officers just sitting around watching a security camera waiting for a crime to happen. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll learn eventually that these guys are on stakeout because there's like a known burglar in the area that he lives in, right? So, and, but what we're going to learn with this scene more, most importantly, is that the boss cop, the main cop, this is Kalmus, is an evil cop who hates everybody and probably smells funny, mm -hmm. right? He's biased against white people and we're going to learn rich people. <laughs> yeah, and Yankees and people from the north, right? Because he says at this point, it's like, it's like we've been invaded from the north. And then he looks at his, his Hispanic partner and says, and the South Officer Ramirez. Somebody's doing the raping, right? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Ramirez, typical. So You're a rapist. All right, so then we cut to Tom's house. His dad and his kid brother are arriving from New York. They're going to wander into the house and never turn on the goddamn lights. Thank you. Yep. What happened? They, they do this a bunch in the movie. Yeah. They have lights and then they don't use them. I assumed that there was going to be some kind of like the cops are going to bust in and because the lights weren't on, they weren't going to know what was happening. Like, I thought that this was going to somehow factor into the plot, but no. Not nope. at all. 
No, it serves no purpose other than maybe they don't know how to light stuff without like getting a glow on the guy's head or something. Mm -hmm. No, I, I seriously, I was like, oh, some surprise thing must be about to happen because it's completely dark in here. But then old guy's just like having trouble walking through the dark set. And he's like, OK, let's have a seat over here by <laughs> the large tape X. I can't find it. Give me a second. <laughs> yep. No, I'm on this one. You you sit there. Ah, uh, yes. Here is a reasonably priced, way too small picture frame to establish that <laughs> I have been in this building before. Right, yeah. So, okay, so yeah, so they sit down at the table in the fucking dark. The old man notices that there's some some suspicious paperwork laid out on the table. We'll get back to that. But before we do, we have to cut back to the cops. Boss cop, the murder cop, goes for a shit, right? And while he's gone, the other two make small talk about how, you know, excessively forceful he is and how he's liable to murder a suspect at any minute. Yeah. One of the actors learned the hand gesture of like handing someone a plate that morning and uses it every four seconds to mean words, right? It'll be like, everyone always says he treats everyone the gesture. Same. Sorry, are you like, are you giving me a plate? What What's happening? Gesture. Well, so yeah, the only way his gesticulations make any sense is if this guy's like personnel report was written on a great marquee in front of him, right? Because <laughs> yeah. you know, he, he's talking about, he's like, you know, I saw his psych report and it said he was like crazy and liable to murder a motherfucker. But he'll like, he'll like hold up his hands as though it's like his name and lights. You know, I don't know what the fuck he was going for. I also love that like nine seconds later, officer murder comes back from his shit. Anything happened in the last nine seconds? I'm a very fast shooter. <laughs> What'd you guys say? I shot so Toilet fast. Toilet paper just hanging out of his pants. It just or drops out of my ass at this my point. Average <laughs> my average is like 11 or 12. I was at nine just now. What'd you guys talk about? My rectum is like a sleeping woman's lips. What did you guys want? What are you talking it's about? So <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. So, so then we, we cut back into the dark house. Tom has returned now to his home. He's brought a pizza. He also doesn't turn on the goddamn lights. The pizza is in witness protection. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's from blank cardboard pizzeria in wherever the fuck. I've literally never seen a blank pizza box before. They had no. to have made that just for this, right? Yeah. Yeah, so occasionally you'll get a misprint, I guess. It's got like a paper bag taped over it like your school textbooks back yeah. then. <laughs> some of us could afford the nice book covers. It's you not all of us. Relate to our yeah, some, some of you. Braggy. White privilege. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm writing in my notes at this point, like is one of them half Mogwai? Is that perhaps why? But yeah, so but dad's there and it turns out the reason dad and kid brother have flown down is that Tom is a stock trader who has caught his partner doing something illegal and turned him into the SEC, right? And dad wants him to not do that because he's making way too much money, you know, to, to like threaten all of that just because of some pesky fraud. Yes. And we should point out that like everything else in this movie, this is just what Tom felt like including in the story, there will never be anything that like verifies that claim. In fact, the only thing we know for sure is that Tom got fired from that job. Right. So he has worked into the movie. Well, it was probably because I was catching my boss for fraud so much. Yeah. There's so much fraud right. I was yeah. catching. I have to imagine that there are all kind of potential lawsuits defamation suits in this fucking movie. For yeah. sure. If if anyone ever bothered to watch this besides us, Tom's going to <laughs> go into libel court for a while. Also, how does dad know any of this information? He's been in the house for like 10 seconds and then he's like, I looked at the table of papers for 10 seconds and they say, you're doing fraud in big letters on the front. Stop. <laughs> Stop doing that. Are you investigating my friend for doing fraud? Oh, and of course, they're all yelling at each other and bad actors getting yelly is so much fun, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and these guys are so bad. I had to double check IMDb at this point to see if like the dad and the little brother were really his dad and little brother playing themselves, right? They weren't, but yeah. uh, it, 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 they're bad enough that you, you felt the need to check. Oh, little miniature Gronkowski for sure, I thought was actually Tom Lareska. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Oh man, when he starts, yeah, he is the worst yeller in a room full of bad yellers. Yeah, he has to work his way up to yelling. He's like, and I told you that I said yeah. no. <laughs> Then he's got to like hit the brakes and slow himself down physically. Remember. Right, right. Wind it back down on the other end too. Yeah. No. And so Tom storms out angered by all the yelling for some fucking reason. They keep in the part where he has to go back in and grab his hoodie and then go back out again. I want, I thought he was going to grab the pizza for sure. And I was <laughs> disappointed. Like you, br- what the fuck you show up. It's three people. You bring one pizza that's yours that's for you to have that pizza that's not enough for three people (laughs) okay you go back in you take that but we do have to talk about how quickly he comes back in because he's like it's like a typical dramatic scene how dare you no how dare you and he's like i'll be back in a second i need to cool off a two mississippi count later he walks back in and he's like hi i'm back i thought the scene was over yeah right well and then he grabs his hoodie and wanders back off are you smoking a pipe? <laughs> so, yeah, so he goes off on a, ha- a huffy little walk or whatever, and his neighbor sees him, like, cut through his backyard and calls 911, right? The line that we get is, like, we see the neighbor at his phone, and it's like, 911, is this an emergency? He's like, yes, it's an emergency. I just saw someone in my backyard. My neighbor, Tom, he cut across at a very small angle, but like a good five, six feet was my backyard. Technically, <laughs> this is an emer- he was wearing a hooded sweatshirt, a hooded right sweatshirt. Yeah, <laughs> ma'am. Yeah. So, OK, so so he's off on his huffy walk. And while he's doing that, we flash back to Tom at work confronting his boss about the fraud. Yeah, and I think it's <laughs> really cool that Cecil got to be in a movie. Uh, where, okay, I think that's really that's pretty accurate. The boss of this trading firm looks like the CEO of a duck hunting firm. More realistically, <laughs> well, so I feel bad now about my. You said he looked like Cecil, and now I can't read my notes <laughs> because I said he looks like everyone I've ever bought cocaine from out the back door of their minimum wage job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Google Cecil from Cogdis and tell me you aren't buying a yeah, little bit no, of cocaine. Okay. See, I said it's like a flashback of a younger, hipper Santa Claus. Right. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so but the argument they're having apparently is that Tom thinks that his boss is being deceptive and tricking wealthy Christians into investing in a fund by pretending that it's way more Christian than it actually is. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's confusing, though. To be clear, that sounds like Noah's describing a church. Tom's not running a church. (laughs) No, he's running a trading operation. (laughs) Well done, sir. And also, so throughout there, and they're having this yelly fight because we just had a yelly fight. What's better than following it up with another? And through this fight, for some fucking reason, the camera work is somewhere between Paul Greengrass and Paul Revere. It Mm -hmm. is jarring. (laughs) Also, uh, one little piece of my best worst on the wall of this investment firm. It's supposed to be in Miami now or New York, Miami and Boca Raton. Okay, regardless, an investment firm in a major city anywhere on the wall has multiple framed U.S. maps like really big. Yeah. For no reason. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Let's see what. Where, where's Minnesota if the map's on the left side of the room? That, that question comes up awful, an awful lot. You guys said it was stupid to put a giant thing on the wall with the map. <laughs> and now we know why I did it. Minnesota's right here. And there's also this great fucking moment. And this, I was so, like, when we when it happened, all of us are just like, oh, please let this be presaging greater things, right? Because during the fight, the boss, who is six feet taller than Tom, right? The character playing Tom. Yep. It says, Hey, wait, are you going to hit me? Character who knows martial arts very well and wrote this movie. (laughs) It's the best. Look, man, we all agree that your hands are lethal weapons, okay? You are great at karate, and I'm intimidated by you. Please do not unholster them on me. Yes. Whatever actions I take later in my life, know that they stem from my deep respect for your karate skills. (laughs) I'm Cecil. <laughs> so, okay. So we back out of that flashback and, and we land on Tom at a little park. Not sure what to do. 
he has the first of two amazing breaking down moments. This actor is not good enough to do. A I almost down. went with best worst crying. Oh yes, because he he is pretty sure it's just close your eyes and say the word ha. <laughs> he looks like he's trying to bob for somehow vertical apples. Like I don't know how <laughs> he's bobbing for dicks. That, yep, yep. And he, so he starts crying and he demands that God explain himself. And then in the first of two moments where I thought maybe this movie was just fucking with me, the voice of God speaks to him. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> he screams out like, God, why does this keep happening to me? And so my first reaction was like, this happened before? What? <laughs> <laughs> this has happened to you multiple times? Okay. Whatever. And then God comes in and it, God's voice is just like me with my pitch down 10% from Audacity yep. editing's tool. And he's like, ask your family to forgive you. Yeah, no. Morgan puts as much effort into God's voice as these guys did. Yes. <laughs> and he's like, Sarah Huckabee Sanders? Yeah. <laughs> but wait, it, it actually gets better because... God says, go ask your dad and brother for forgiveness. And he says, they're supposed to forgive me. Yes, yes. Yeah, he's not at all surprised that God is speaking directly to him in the park. He's arguing with the motherfucker. <laughs> it's it's so long and so much. For the whole time, I was like, please, just a little kid be like, hey, guy, hey, guy, playing on the playground <laughs> over here. I'm on the merry-go-round. The fuck are you doing? <laughs> And then, so, okay, so he goes home, you know, to, to forgive his brother and his dad or whatever, and the cops pull up, and the voiceover cuts in to be like, that's weird, I've never seen police here before. What purpose do they think that that narration served in that moment? <laughs> okay, to be clear, he's at a playground. So he's a grown-up who goes to the playground all the time and weeps all the time, and there's never <laughs> cops there. And now all of a sudden there's cops here? What the, the fuck police is this never come, yeah. I better put that in the narration. Yeah, no, actually, so we, we should clarify, too, because, like, he's screaming in the park. That would be a sensible time for cops to show up, right? There's a crazy guy screaming at God in the park. Or not screaming at this playground, yeah. Well, right. But this is supposed to be after he's walked home, right? This We're in his front yard at this point. So the cops escalate very quickly, right? Because, again, it's him writing the, the story. Now, I'm not going to say that... You know, cops didn't escalate very quickly. They very often do that and shit. But we're just getting his side of the story here, which we already know is kind of bullshitty to begin with. Thank you. Right. No, see, I, I, the biggest conflict I have in this film is I don't believe cops, but I definitely don't believe this guy also. Also him. Yeah. It's all <laughs> liars. It's just about who's lying a little bit more at any given moment. Yeah, the it's the turtles. Him. It's all the way yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because what happens is the cops are like, what are you doing here with a hoodie? They actually say that. Mm -hmm. And they give him like half a second and then they're like, too slow, pepper spray. And then they pepper yeah. spray him for <laughs> right. allegedly 30 straight minutes just straight into his eyes. Yeah. Just a fucking fireman's hose of pepper spray <laughs> concentrated <laughs> on his face. Also, they, <laughs> allegedly, according to this guy, because he put it in his movie, they pants him. Yep. Yeah. So cops are like, let's beat him up and pepper spray him. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to pants him too. Just don't, don't knock him out. <laughs> He's a little prank. We have fun. We have some fun. Which, can I say, kind of ruins the gravitas that he's going for in this movie is that every time we get a wide shot, we see his fucking boxer briefs and his right. shorts around his ankles. Yeah, well, so, okay. So as near as we can tell watching the movie, you know, skeptically, what almost certainly happened is the cops were looking for some burglar that had been in that neighborhood. They started questioning him and he's like, how fucking dare you question me in my own home? And, you know, got all like snooty with them. The cops later said he went for their gun. Probably did. You know, the guy can't stop talking about how many martial arts he knows, etc. So probably did. Probably did try to fight back or something like that. And the cops freaked out and way overreacted the way cops did and sprayed the shit out of him with some pepper spray until he needed to be hospitalized, right? right? That's probably what actually happened. Yeah. I have to clarify because, of course, the movie never will. No, and, and but I will say there's a good argument for that because even in his own movie where he choreographed it, he has himself reaching for the gun, right? Like there's not. Yes. If I were making a movie about how I didn't go for a cop's gun, I would not have the actor playing me <laughs> go for the cop's gun. 
Yeah, right. And keep in mind, he's producing it, right? So, like, right. He had some say He was in there this. on set and he was like, and I obviously don't go for his gun. And he was like, well, maybe you, maybe you slap it. Yes. Just, <laughs> so, just slap his karate it. instincts were too strong right, not to go for the weapon. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. So the cops pants him and knock him down and torture him with pepper spray. And the, eventually so, so badly that he stops breathing. Right. And, and again, I don't want to make too much light of that because that's really fucked up and cops do that kind of shit all the goddamn time. We'll make light of what happens next, though, in the movie, because it's that his spirit <laughs> lifts out of his body like a goddamn <laughs> Bugs Bunny cartoon. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. It's the stupidest <laughs> fucking thing. I've, this is the other moment where I'm like, okay, well, clearly you're just fucking with me now. <laughs> <laughs> so all the cops are super cool about the, they're beating him up. They're spraying him with pepper spray. But then all of a sudden, the death sound effect, soul rising sound mm -hmm. effect happens. Yeah, yeah, right. They apparently can see it. Which is a literal, it was like, bing, and they're all like, stop. <laughs> stop <really loud. laughs> I think oh, we went shit. too far. Did you guys hear that? That was a death rattle, I can swear. That means an angel got its wings. I think we fucked up. <laughs> oh, damn it, guys. The white people dying alarm went off. We got to get one of those for black people, too. It makes right. our job so much easier. Do we? Easy. Yeah. One other detail about the soul rising up. I'm curious mm -hmm, about this. Mm -hmm. Apparently, according to the canon in this universe, when you die after being pantsed and then your soul rises up, <laughs> your soul gets to have the pants back on. because that Right. Would be it doesn't have to reach up and pull because you don't want your first action in the afterlife to be have to, have to be pulling up your pants. I right. get it. Buttoning up in front of St. Peter. That's funny. You get to St. Peter and you're like, Blah! oh, shit. Uh, it, just, it was <laughs> around my out. ankles. Digs out. Right. Sorry, second. it was just that it wasn't my choice. Oh, I so. broke my nose. <laughs> I think I broke my nose. <laughs> and then the cops, so the cops, I guess, like stalled the ambulance at the, the at the gate of this gated community for a while. So they but they finally let him through. And as the as, as the ambulance is getting through, we watch his spirit like marvel at its translucence, and then it's hit with like heaven tractor beam. Mm -hmm. And God's like, don't worry about it. It's all good. This is normal. It happens all the time. I also have to point out that when the ambulance gets there, we get to watch all these actors realize simultaneously they don't know how to use a stretcher, right? Like they got an ambulance, <laughs> they got a stretcher, but these three extras are like, I don't know. Oh, we should have asked just, them how to do collapse. Do we use it, it like a to sled? <laughs> pivot. Who rides it before he's pivot. on it? What do you mean pivot? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Turn your side. <laughs> I love to, because again, he's writing all the lines. And so all the EMTs gather around and they're all sitting like right in the middle of this circle of cops going. So they obviously tortured him to death with pepper spray, right? And like, yep, yes. sure. Tortured him to death with pepper spray. The exact quote is, it looks like he was pepper sprayed point blank. Yes. How would they? Oh, I could see from the spray pattern that this was, <laughs> that the thing was close as opposed He's the to the Dexter far. of pepper spray. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then the narrator cuts in with the second best line in the movie, I thought. He says, and I quote, Kalmus, that's the bad cop, the officer murder. He says, Kalmus and accomplices finished inflicting grievous bodily harm with malicious intent to kill and destroy me. End quote. <laughs> Footnote eight. See the law. U.S. C. 137. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, I I know this won't be as wide appealing as it is to us, but occasionally here at God Awful Movies, we get a stupid letter from a stupid person who thinks they can use legal language to get us to not make fun of their movie. Yes. This is the narration version of that, right? <laughs> Forthwith, yes. Kalmus did do unto me the crimin so <laughs> if thou hoopst. And then, so they load him onto this stretcher. They go to put the stretcher up. And this is where they really realize, oh, fuck, how do these little things, can we put him up with the wheels still down? Yeah. <laughs> so we watch We watch them get it and get excited. Like they slide yes. it into the little side. Oh, that's cool. It's the best. It slides it's, into it's a It's like they slot. tried to put a stretcher into the overhead on an airplane for like <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> I could watch these people try to put that stretcher into that ambulance for the rest of my natural Yep, for the remaining 50 life. minutes of this film, yep. <laughs> They're like a U-Haul ramp? Fuck, this is, oh, they collapsed. Yes. Okay. 
So, okay. So we cut inside the ambulance. And he's getting, there's this great moment where he gets shocked back into his body. Right. So it's like this silly falling back to earth and he's going, whoa, like like he's Joey on Blossom. Right. On his way down or whatever. Whoa. Yeah. So I, honestly, <laughs> I was like, OK, this is funny if God's doing like a prank and being like, OK, you're going actually down. You're going down. Too. <laughs> I got him. Did you guys see? I got I got him for a while there. He I really so did. happy. News. I even put his six pants bucks. back on. Come on. Six bucks from everybody. I did it. <laughs> no, now I'm pantsing it's you. Two dollars from each of you now. This It's like Job. It's all about a bet. And while this is happening, just to be clear, in case you were going to take this guy seriously or his opinion seriously, the entire ambulance ride cop murder guy will be casually trying to extra murder him. <laughs> yes. Like he's on okay. the oxygen and the cop turns off his oxygen. Yes. Like Stewie trying to kill Lois. Yes. And the EMT guy goes, hey, who turned off the oxygen? And they look and he's like twiddling his thumbs and whistling. Well, <laughs> you turned off the oxygen. Okay. <laughs> okay. The same guy, Calmus, murder cop, literally at the beginning of this ambulance ride, they're in the back of an ambulance, like yes. four people. And he... Leans over, over Tom, and he's like, I just killed you. And nobody addresses that. Yeah, I feel like one of the EMTs. Nobody's like, you just, <laughs> did you just say I just killed you? <laughs> I see your hand reaching to turn off the oxygen. What are you doing, man? I mean, ring, 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 ring. Is that a chainsaw? No. <laughs> you have a chainsaw. You <laughs> they turn, and he's just got a giant Gallagher hammer. Do you guys mean... <laughs> Mind leaving me in the ambulance with him for a second? Yeah. His head might explode. The slapstick nature that they played this scene with was insane. Oh. After that happens, after the like oxygen thing, the EMT's like, okay, you obviously did that. Murder cop pouts about getting yes. caught. That, that's, the, that's the consequence. Yes. He's just like, no. I, you did catch me. Yeah, no, no, he, he's upset in the manner of like, you know, I just mopped this floor and you tracked mud over it when he comes back to life, right? <laughs> The movie, it also says, it says time of resurrection, 1.42 a.m. or whatever. I'm like, dude, it's called resuscitation. Calm down, Jesus Christ of Nazareth over here. Okay. <laughs> Miracle achieved at 1.43. Yeah. <laughs> Let me put that into my very official medical records. Well, but, and, and we should point out, too, that they don't show, like, you know, the, the EMTs, like, doing CPR and him coming back to life. By the time he comes back to life, they're all just kicked back. You know, they're checking their phones, right? They're all chilling. And he just comes back to life all on his own. He, he wants you to know that he did the real work there, I guess. But anyway, so but eventually they get him to the hospital. They're wheeling him in. There's this weird incongruent narration that comes in to explain that blue lives do matter, though. This, right. Yeah. This is the best because, look, this is very clearly a right wing Christian who experienced for a second what it's like not to have the maximum amount of privilege in this country. And so the way that he can do that without exploding like one of the bad guys from Scanners is to use his narration during this moment to be like, just bad apples and it's a hard job and I'm proud to be an American yeah. I'm free. He's singing that while he's like half dead, to be clear. Yes. That's yeah. the narration is what's happening. Yeah. And so they wheel him into the hospital. The doc's like, hey, did you guys pants this dude and pepper spray him for a half hour and they're like you pantsed him and pepper spray you tried to murder him just now and then got caught and then pouted in the your ambulance. chainsaw Look, <laughs> we're all in on it okay if, if for, for future in case anyone looks into what happened here we are everyone in this hospital all the police the emt everyone is in on it yeah right do we all agree now yeah and the doctor is like what do you take the fucking cuffs off? It's an unconscious, almost dead person. You need to take the cuffs off right now. And the cop's like, fine. And he goes, yes. 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 Hopefully he takes the cuffs off. He grabs the guy's arm and hits him in the side of the leg. Stop resisting. He puts the cuffs back on. <laughs> but seriously, it's it's pretty funny for the rest of the movie. The cops are going to be like sneaking in there and putting cuffs back on the guy for no reason. Yes. yes, to the extent that I thought throughout the movie, like he would go up to Itch's face and he'd just be cuffed again. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, OK, so Calmus walks out and he gets with the other two cops from before so that they can kind of get their story straight. 
And they're going for like, look, these cops were all in it together. That's why a bunch of people maybe disagree with me about what happened. Mm -hmm. But instead of playing it as cops, like all conspiring, it kind of reads like cop boss has Jedi mind control. Right? <laughs> He's like, we, we all read him as Miranda rights. We all read him as Miranda rights. <laughs> he was not the droids we were looking for. He wasn't the droids. We, were like, yeah, we right, all right. saw him be a black guy for a good five <laughs> seconds. Right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> you could tell he just, his vibe was very good at karate. Vibe was very good at karate. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this movie just peaked. So I guess we want to pause now so everybody can soak it in before we start the downhill slide. So we'll be back in a minute with even more. I can't breathe. And look at this. I got a free headset. This plan just keeps getting better and better. Hey, guys, what you celebrating? Yeah. Noah came up with the best plan for us to get free phone service. He did? Yeah, sure did. I just got a job as a 911 operator. Okay. Right. And what phone call is free from any phone in the U.S.? That's right. 911. So whenever I need to talk to Noah, I just call 911 free. Right. But that, that assumes that he's working. Yeah. And that he's the one that answers when you call. Mm -hmm. Also that, yes. But otherwise, perfect plan, right? Right. I, I mean, guys, if you want to save money on your cell phone bill, why don't you just try... Mint Mobile. Oh, what's Mint Mobile? Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. 15 bucks a month? How is that even possible? By going online only and eliminating the traditional costs of retail, Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Okay, but do I have to give up my Nokia? I have my snake score saved on here. No, you do not. You can use your phone with any Mint Mobile plan and switch easily in minutes with eSIM. I switched to Mint Mobile when they first became a sponsor, and I get the same great service for a fraction of the price I was paying before. That's why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse it as a product. All right, Eli, we're sold. Where do we sign up? To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. All right. Well, looks like you won't need that job at the call center after all, Noah. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let him know when my shift is over. Wait, Noah, you're supposed to be answering 911 calls right now? Well, yeah, but I, I wanted to show Heath the headset. Headset. You should probably get back to work. I should. I should get back to work. Yeah. Hey, Tom, you got a second? Hey, I sure do. What's up, guy who's helping me make this movie? Yeah, right. So I was just reading over the scene in the movie where the evil murder cops confirm their evil murder plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and first of all, okay, broken record. I know. Please do not write this movie. Please just don't just stop doing it. Mm, no. <sighs> okay, yeah. Had to try just one more time for my soul. Okay, second problem is that you seem a tad in conflict with your own script. Mm, how so? Yeah, so for instance, in this scene right here, you have Murder Cop 1 say, I'll tell you what, I'm a bad apple, but most cops are heroes. It's a hard job, and I hope everyone doesn't judge police as a group by my actions. So, you see how, like, ham-handed that is? I do not, no. Okay. Well, later, when they're hiding the body cam footage, you have one guy deleting the files on the computer... And the other guy is just chanting, nothing but love for our troops over and over again. Nothing but love for our troops. Right, right. Um, Tom, let me ask you something real quick. Always. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that you have a, frankly, bad worldview and that the reason you've included these weird talking points for no reason is that your personal experience directly contradicts your beliefs? Mm. I mean, how do you think I'm still a Christian? Yep, yep. That tracks a good point. All right. Please don't make the movie. I'm making the movie. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call it slavery. <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action in the waiting room of the hospital where Tom's dad and kid brother eagerly await news about him. <laughs> right. The cops, 
The cops <laughs> passed by and they're like, oh, we're so worried about him. And the cops are like, I'll paper spray you to death, old man. <laughs> <laughs> he literally gets in the dad's face and he was like, and then he was crying like a little baby. Yes, Wait. right. <laughs> right before the ambulance came and resuscitated him. <laughs> <laughs> The only reason so, we didn't get him down quicker is because he was taking steroids. I'm sure that must have been because he yep. attacked me. He attacked me. He must have had like Captain America juice or he couldn't have physically <laughs> dominated me even for a second. Impossible. His wrist control. He had complete and total control of my wrist. Right now, I still feel as though I am a ghost and my wrists are controlled by someone else. <laughs> so, I don't know that I'll ever control my wrists again. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, so they wander off. Later that night, we, we, we see Kalmus flirting with a nurse when in walks Kevin the fuck Sorbo. <laughs> God, he might as well be accompanied by like fucking funk music. <laughs> if he walked in and said, hey, everybody, it's me, actor Kevin Sorbo. TV's Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> clip, clop, clip, clop. I'm a Clydesdale. I'm in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, he walks in and it turns out he's the lawyer for the police union. Yeah. So he goes and talks to murder cop Calmus. And <laughs> Calmus is so dumb. Right away, he's like, hi, I'm the uh, lawyer for the police union. Fuck you. Oh, what? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's start over. I'm on your team as your lawyer. Stop resisting. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Calmus is like, why do I need an attorney? And I'm like, I don't know, dude. Maybe the guy in the other room that you kill. Yeah. <laughs> and this actor's so fucking starstruck. Every time he delivers a line, he does a sheepish little grin like, yeah. did I do good? TV's Kevin Sorbo. We act together. <laughs> we acted together. Do you mind if I call you a co-star, Kevin Sorbo? <laughs> I'm just going to take a selfie during this, during the shot. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's, and it takes like so long for the cop to real, so Kevin Sorbo's character is supposed to be going in there giving him all the right answers, right? He's like, so you probably kept him cuffed because he was such a danger to himself and others, right? Is that correct? And but it takes the cop so long to realize that that's what's going on. You know, he's like, nah, man, it's because fuck that guy. <laughs> and he's like, let's try this again. Again, could have watched that for the rest of the movie. <laughs> oh, and then there's this moment. So he goes to leave. And, they, and he stops and he chats with a doctor on the way out. And it's so weird and random that I actually thought that the hospital they were in, a doctor walked by and was like, oh, shit, it's TV's Kevin Sorbo. Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> and they were like, keep rolling. This is gold. <laughs> you want an apple, some oats in a bucket? Mm. Are you, there you go. disappointed? Mm. You say it? Will you say it? So, okay. So then we cut back to Tom in the hospital. He's been recuffed. This is the first of many times. <laughs> it's the best. You might as well be like in the Hannibal Lecter thing with like a cage over his face and he's he's on a moving truck. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's got a boot for a car on his foot in the next. <laughs> So yeah, so he wakes up shackled to the thing. The doctor that K-Sorbs just buddied up comes in and she says, hey, I'm mandating the Baker Act for this guy, which like means that they can involuntarily uh, hold him for a psychological evaluation. Yeah, that's a real thing in Florida. That's a yeah. rule. That, that's a law. In Georgia, too, I believe. Involuntarily yeah. put apparently an unconscious guy into a mental institution. Yes. And then he wakes up there. Yep. Yeah. So and the the redheaded doctor though she's like oh this is some kind of cover up I'll have nothing to do with it and the cops like I bet this will be important later in the movie when you come to tell your side of the story and 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 she's like nope you will literally never see, I'm gonna pray over him now nope and you will never see me again in this film I'm just a character that he invented while he was asleep that disagreed with you yep about yes, this exactly yeah. about whether he attacked the cops I disagree. <laughs> Lady, I made up for my movie. <laughs> and also, like, after doing a bunch of doctor shit, she prays over him. She lays her hands over him and she says, God, look over this one or whatever, in case anybody in the audience was going to mistakenly attribute his recovery to medical intervention. Yeah. I would literally rather someone come over me while I was asleep and pepper spray me gently than pray <laughs> over me. <laughs> Just, you know, kind of like they're for breezing the room. I'd take yes. it. <laughs> And the PO's like, I was fucked, but God saved me. Also, doctors. So, okay. 
And then we cut to Sorbo's Oscar sequence here, right? This is his Oscar pitch. This is the scene where he's in the office with the chief of police and all the bad guy cops. They, they dismiss all the bad guy cops from the scene right away. They're like, look, Ka- Kevin Sorbo is going to act so big. There won't be room for all. Of Kevin Sorbo's here. doing his coffee is for closers monologue is, yes. is the rule. <laughs> so, yeah, so the chief kicks all the other cops out. And he says, listen, K. Sorbs, you know, this could be a pretty serious situation. You know, a similar thing happened a couple of police departments over. And, you know, when they murdered a suspect who was in police custody, it, quote, caused quite a ruckus. Yep. (laughs) Murdering people does cause a ruckus. I can't. He doesn't want a ruckus in his department. It was a murdery kerfuffle. Let me tell you so much paperwork. Any second now, Kevin Sorbo is going to start singing. Give him the old razzle dazzle. His monologue here is insane. He's just like, look, there's truth. And then there's perception. There's coffee. And then there's closers. It's so (laughs) fucking dumb and random and all over the fucking map. But yes, he's about to do a little soft shoe us for us at any minute. He doesn't. But we cut from there to Tom's psych evaluation. Right? Yeah. And again, keep in mind, what we're about to see is Tom fail a psych evaluation. So this is his side of that story. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. Well, and in case you're wondering how biased they were against him, the first question she says is, she's like, today, I'm going to determine why you attacked all the officers in a steroid <laughs> rage. When did you stop beating up the cop and you're on steroids? Yes. Is the question? I, <laughs> I literally wrote, when did you stop beating your wife who is a cop? Yes. Like, <laughs> That's this is his story about the psych value. So he got tricked by that and wrote it into his own story. Yeah. And he also accidentally gives away that it was very clearly roiding during this scene because she's like, oh, we see that you're on Halidol. And he's like, no. And she's like, Look, man, even in the fictional version, I would know that from a blood test. I'm not <laughs> guessing which steroids you're on. And he's like, no, you're a lying. I did. Uh, <laughs> OK, let's let's uh, let's take it back. Uh, one more question. Just, you know, general thing. You're insane. Yes. Or and he's like, <laughs> you, <clears throat> he's like, I would never be like violent or whatever. And she goes, well, what about that flashback with you and your boss? You look pretty mad. Then he's like, this isn't, it was just an argument. And then he delivers the greatest line that I have heard in, like, it's been years since I've laughed this hard at one of our movies. Legitimately. He goes, and we've all written it in our notes in all caps. Yep. Right. We've all transcribed. He writes, I'm well trained in two disciplines of martial arts. Two. disciplines (laughs) disciplines <laughs> not one of martial arts he's got multiple black belts and but his point is is that like hey look if i attack those cops you're gonna seen some damage okay oh, i want it i drive a dodge stratus two martial arts <laughs> i wanted so bad for the psychiatrist to be like oh two different martial arts and a stratus okay that's weird because uh martial arts wise the cops were risk controlling you this whole time. I think <laughs> they just they cuffed you Turned easily. Turned out to be pretty useless, those martial arts skills of yours. Do you want me to queue up for you? I can queue up. <laughs> queue up. Let me show you this kata. Let me- did you, okay. <laughs> did you, is one of them pancration from ancient Greece because they didn't know about the risk control yet? Because it sounds like... Do you have a very thin... Your martial arts, sir. ...pine board I could break for you <laughs> on my fifth or sixth try? Because I think that's really going to bring this point home. So, <laughs> I, I have one. It's not perforated. Does it need to be perforated? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> okay. Oh, God, it was so, like, honestly, I laughed so hard at that moment that like the EMTs nearly had to come and revive my ass. So yeah. but she's like, no, you have failed your psych evaluation. I guess this is a, a pass fail kind of thing. And we're arresting you for resisting arrest. Right. And again, I want to be very clear. Like, I know that the precedent of this movie is that everyone is in on it and it's a total conspiracy. But like, you have to be pretty fucking crazy to fail a psych evaluation. (laughs) We watch him fail it in his description of his life in his movie. Right. Seriously, the, the psychiatrist is like at the end, basically checking out if he really does have rage issues. And then at one point she's just like, "Okay, I'm just writing something down. And he's like, what are you writing? And he. 
I want him to grab it and it's just like, Karate. I'm writing this as a test. Hey, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. How many martial arts are you well trained in? <laughs> <laughs> so, and apparently, by the way, they had two cops waiting. Like, you know, she hits a buzzer and two cops immediately walk in the door to arrest him. Right. So, and then we cut to the weirdest scene. Now, normally I would just leave this scene out of the movie be, or out of our description of the movie, rather, because it just doesn't, it never comes back. It doesn't, never matters and shit. But the, the fucking cheese plate is so bad. We have to talk about it. So, oh my, oh my God. The pepperoni volcano. Are we talking yes. about the I was pepperoni furious. volcano? <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's such a bad cheese plate. There's only one type of meat. It's salami. Also two types of cheese. One of them is fucking like mild Monterey Jack. Yes. Right. And then there's like eight Triscuits. They're for, Triscuits. For these four just... people. They're going to have two crackers each. I... <laughs> what the fuck? I screenshot this so that next time I'm mad at Heath, I can send it to him as a punishment. <laughs> it's so pathetic. But this is his HOA meeting and saying that they should try to kick him out of the neighborhood for being a cop attacker. Right. They're in on it, too. Which, again, is only in this movie because this is just the fucking stream of consciousness of this nutbag. Right. Right. Because if this movie were true to form, it would just go. And another thing that that the HOA were in on it, too, because they just they just were jealous of me. For, they, yeah. My right. Good Again, karate. <laughs> he's going to like lose his job and lose everything anyway. So like him, we, we don't need to explain why he's not in his house or anything. This is just him going. And those assholes at the HOA, I bet they have terrible charcuterie boards. <laughs> and they do. They do. I support that part of the, the movie. OK, honestly, the only good part of the scene that I really, really enjoyed was the one angry guy at the HOA yes, meeting. Yes. Who, the one who's eating the this cheese, cheese plate. Yes. So <laughs> fucking much. But he, he's, he's angrily eating it because, of course, yes, he's, he's still going to eat eating, it. Yes. But he's hate eating this <laughs> shitty cheese plate. It's the best. Okay. See, now, I hate to argue on air, but I'm going to throw this out there. I actually think that this scene was meant to convey the HOA and their fancy cheese plates. Like, I think, <laughs> oh, I think you're right. <laughs> I think he looked at the pepperoni volcano and he was like, Shh, luxury. Am I right? <laughs> I think they had crudite on it. I don't know. It's a, some fancy word. And then this movie's going to take a weird minute to ask us to buddy up to deadbeat dads for a second. This weirdly <laughs> sympathetic movie. Yeah. So we cut over to Tom in jail. And we have this weird moment where like his cellmate is talking about how, well, you know, I'm, I'm in here for failing to pay child support. And he's like, well, how can you pay his child support if you're in jail? And he's like, yeah, it's just this system is so unfair to fathers. So <laughs> against men. <laughs> Isn't it weird how the deadbeat dad like starts the conversation to? Yes. <laughs> They're in jail. And he's just like, hey, bud, is this a cell spot taken? I'm mean, we're next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> You want to talk about suicide? And then that's actually what they talk about for a second. And then he reveals, yeah, I'm a deadbeat dad. You should uh, have some pity on me. Yeah. Terrifying. Well, he's looking at these pictures and and Tom says to him, your kids? And I really wanted him to be like, no, no, I'm just a pedophile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to trade? I'll, I'll he give says, you your kids? I'm like, you better fucking hope there is kids. <laughs> Cool. Can we not talk to each other from now on? I know. Can I just lean my arms out of my food slot in peace? I don't. I, that doesn't indicate that I want to talk to you through your food slot. Also, why doesn't this gentleman have a neck? Right. The guy in the next cell over. Like, did he lose that in the divorce, too? He did. I yeah, that was part of the settlement. Sure. All right. All right. But this is where the this is the first time that the movie explicitly references its whole premise, which is that Tom is the modern day Joe. Which, the, can we just say, Yikes. wow, yes. wow, at the confidence to be like, you know who I'm like, the most unfortunate person in the Bible. Yes. This is second only to comparing yourself to Jesus on the cross. Yeah, right, right. It's the next step down. And, and, and we learn this because the cellmate guy is like, uh, hey, you know, I actually happen to know a bunch of quotes from the book of Job. And he's like, and you're a deadbeat dad. So knowing that book doesn't make you moral, I guess, huh? <laughs> and just to be clear, God has a plan that includes you being a deadbeat dad. That's that's what you're saying? Right. Yeah, exactly. And so, and there's this great moment and it encapsulates so much about Christianity that I have to include it. Tom says to the cellmate, he says, do, so you believe that stuff? And then the cellmate guy says, and I quote, I believe there are barriers. Walls, 
Now, you might be thinking to yourself, fucking what? Right? Because that's what you would think. But that's the kind of shit that Christians have to say to avoid ever directly saying that they do or do not believe in their own holy book. Yeah. Okay. You're asking if I had thought a guy got swallowed by a fish and then came out seven days later. I was asking about that. Yes. Are you saying, are you saying, yes? I believe there are walls. Life is like a box of chocolates. Sorry, but the whale? How is the wall? What? The stars. I wanted to, I wanted other prisoners to be yelling from the background at this point. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's not a good apologetic. That's a dumb example. There's a dishonest answer. He's using he's using the Kalam cosmological argument because the cosmological argument doesn't hold up. That's why he's trying to use Kalam on you. <laughs> Gonna shank you later, though, stupid. <laughs> category error. And then we got over to his bail hearing and his lawyer is presenting his case like a nine year old reading you her book report. Okay, but literally reading from approximately a book report. Yes. The lawyer is reading from a large book, holding it out in front of her and she's like, my client is (laughs) checks notes an upstanding citizen that needed to be checked on and read verbatim from a book. Mm -hmm. And, And then the judge is like, but Upstanding citizen, maybe, but he's from New York. Yeah, there's a lot As of if that was a counter argument. Yeah, the judge goes, This is not a trial. Now, I would like to give my opinion on this trial. I have a speech about Jew New Yorkers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, right. So, yeah, there's a big part of his stupid fucking script that relies on this whole like, well, you know, Southerners are very prejudiced against Northerners thing. And there is something to that, but not in fucking Boca. <laughs> no. Shut the fuck up. It's like 99% people who were in New York living there within the last two years. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> or they're dead. It's the sixth fucking borough. Yeah. I'm Rabbi Morty of Fortsbaum and I can't stand you. No, yeah, right. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Mushbucha, I feel fucking break, <laughs> and then and and the and the judge is denying him bail. He's like, "Hey, look, man, this is a guy who just like angrily walked out of his own psych evaluation." Um, no, I'm not letting him out of jail yet. He has to do a for real Z psych evaluation. How many martial arts has he mastered? That's an important <laughs> thing. Is it three or more? <laughs> she looks down at her book. Two. No, no, oh, it's it's two. Yeah, and then he yells at the bailiffs and threatens them. I bet that's going to help his I didn't attack the cops argument later. (laughs) Again, this is his story. Yes. Why not just have you be calm on your way out? Yeah. Oh, shit. So so we get him back in the cell. The cellmate offers him a Bible. (laughs) Yeah. The stupid necklace cell guy is like, you want this Bible? Because of the job. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you want this Bible? Fuck you. <laughs> and that's the whole scene. Yep. And okay, so now we're going to cut to a different psych evaluation. And you can tell that this is a good guy psychologist because it's a man instead of a woman. And his office is cluttered instead of blindingly white. Mm. <laughs> right. So he'll get a fair hearing here. He's a down to earth, homey prison psychologist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, you caught me as I was just finishing up my knitting for the day. Let me put this away. Would you like a hot cup of hot cocoa? Okay. <laughs> if both of those things were actually in the scene, they would have made more sense than the other physical objects on this guy. He has a scientific calculator on his desk. <laughs> the psychiatrist. What the fuck is he doing with that? So the psychiatrist has him sit down. He's like, so, you know, how how are things? And he's like, I'm I'm in jail, man. And he's like, right. Yes. Stupid question. Sorry. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. And then he says, you know, I, I I, would really enjoy it if you could just just kind of grind this movie to a screeching fucking halt and fill us in on some of your your pointless biographical information. <laughs> and he's like, yep, sure can do that. Yeah. Have you ever been stuck at dinner with one of Heath Enright's absolutely terrible childhood friends? Could you do your best impersonation of that person for me right now for, I would say, 70 or 80 minutes? He asks him for some stock tips. He gives you COVID. Right? Yeah. (laughs) When Tom is monologuing about how good he was on Wall Street, which again, he wrote this movie about himself, bragging about himself. Yes. He explains that he'd been trading on the NASDAQ 
for yeah. 10 years. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. Yeah, he gets a, and they talk about Apple stock <laughs> right after that. Yeah. I've been on the NASDAQ. I'm allowed there. I'm allowed there. Not not on the floor, but I haven't. I'm an, I'm an E-Trade account owner. <laughs> they don't just give those away. What you have an author to... for Substack. Again, this guy allegedly is a real Wall Street guy, and he wrote this. And the the psychiatrist is like, yeah, tell me tell me about your job there. And he's like, I'm a market maker. And then the rest of the scene can't even describe correctly what that would be or how that would fit in. Because the psychiatrist is like, oh, so then uh, what about uh, Apple stock? I got some earlier. What are your thoughts on like buying, selling it now? <laughs> and Tom's like, well, you know, I'm a market maker. So my thoughts are a bid price and an ask price. And you would lose either way. If assuming that my job is done. Is <laughs> I don't give so tips. I'm just like basically a robot that has like a small gap in the middle where I can make money. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So and 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 so this guy's like, well, obviously you're completely sane and 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 you love the police. I'm going to let you out of jail. The music acts like the two of them are about to do a dance number together. Like they're going to have a friendship montage. They're skipping yeah. through fields of flowers. <laughs> they meet up with Morgan Freeman on a beach. Yeah, right. Tandem bicycle <laughs> and the whole nine. So, okay. But he gets out of jail. He gets home and we see him like going through the mail and his, all his bills are past due. Now he has a you're fired letter from his boss. Yeah. Which <laughs> he reads out loud. Yep, <laughs> which is just like when a house fell on and killed Job's entire family. I think we can agree. Very similar. I wonder if he reads all his mail out loud. He's like, ah, oh, God damn it. Publishers clearing house so much shit. So <laughs> if you want me to be empathetic about your character, you have to not look like this and wear this shirt and have this face. Thank it's you. It's impossible. That's You yeah. can't like this guy. It's impossible. So Beck Pfeifengesicht or whatever, he's like the perfect one. So <laughs> God. That's a slappable face in German. Thank you. He, I was like, Thank, is he going to yeah, explain his skeptocrat word of the day? Or is one of his new character takes that he just speaks German? So Listen to the fucking shows. Yeah. So, so I, I'd forgotten. So I was on I'm that. I'm right. <laughs> so, Yeah. So, so there's a knock on the door. It's a process server. He's being sued by his HOA. Right. Now, there's this great moment of Christian space work. Right. He. He clearly doesn't know how reading a stack of papers works, right? Like he pulls these papers out. His pantomimes might as well include taking a bite out of them. He tries to sift through them, but from the top where they're stapled together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he draws conclusions <laughs> anyway. There's a lot of notes on the top left corner in this tiny little spot. That's just, <laughs> what I've gathered is that I'm being evicted. <laughs> Well, they've numbered the pages sequentially, I see. <laughs> <laughs> also, they do the thing of like, you know, the process server shows up and he's like, Tom Lareska. And he like nods, I guess. And he's like, you've been served. So that counts. It Does the movie think like if you never say yes, you can avoid court forever as like one Who's simple trick? Who's <laughs> <laughs> the, the things that movie thinks process serving are is fascinating to me. They're right. doing costumes. They're doing backflips <laughs> over fences. <laughs> it's Assassin's Creed up in this shit. Like, if you're just running away from that guy, diving out windows and shit, you never go to court? Like, I'm actually kind of yeah. asking, too. <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Let's get Andrew on for this. So, yeah. So, okay. And now he's going to call a lawyer. And I thought he was calling a lawyer about this lawsuit from the HOA. But no, he is just now calling a criminal lawyer. Right. We have a scene where he like calls the lawyer's office and he's like, yeah, you know, I've been accused of like trying to attack cops and I need a I need a lawyer. I'm like, well, this explains why you've been in jail for so long, you fucking idiot. Yes. <laughs> well, And again, this is very like, clearly an attempt by him to make his story more sympathetic by lumping all the shit that was his fault with the stuff that wasn't. Right? Yeah. He's like, hey, lawyer, I need you to get me off this police brutality thing, which is probably not my fault. And. And also all the other stuff, which is definitely my yeah. fault. But I need you to do the... <laughs> yeah. And the, and the lawyer is like apparently a little bit busy. The person who answers is like, yeah, Mr. Whatever lawyer is busy. And then he's like, I'll pay double. 
works <laughs> and it works but like <laughs> yes. you, you couldn't think of a number between one and two man as you're, <laughs> you're you're a wall street trader you're not familiar with any numbers in that range between one and two well oh. and and by the way you say you know mr whatever's it's it's mr rosenberg is the name of sure the is lawyer, so. sure is mr <laughs> jerusalem mr so, new york the jewish part not the palestinian to be clear <laughs> There are no Palestinian parts of Jerusalem. Either. Wow. <laughs> wow. You're canceled. You're wow. super canceled. Stay away from the fence. So Eli hates Palestinians. <laughs> so then we get a Tom trying to prove his innocence like montage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's such a stupid execution of the montage concept. It's like a training montage for Rocky, but like end of meetings with a handshake is what we're getting. Over yes, yeah, over. right. Yeah, looking through boxes. That's the whole fucking thing. The narrator tells us he spent tens of thousands of dollars on lawyers and private investigators, and none of them were able to corroborate the goddamn <laughs> premise of this movie. Which, of course, <laughs> is evidence that it's a conspiracy. Okay. Right, yeah, the conspiracy is why. <laughs> yeah. I just want to throw in one more detail here. This is part of my best worst. He met with a lawyer. We just see them shake hands, but behind the mm -hmm. lawyer... On his like big back desk area, there's a stack of 150 baseball hats just stacked on each other, one on top of the other. Oh, interesting. What's happening? Where do these people <laughs> think they are? It's a good question. Yep. <laughs> so they were building a set for a lawyer and they're like, we're going to need, let's say, 150 baseball caps. How many hats does your average lawyer have? <laughs> <laughs> this one's a good one. Let's up it. So, yeah. Okay. But so then we get him at home. He's just hired his lawyer. He, he's he's doing a little reading and he gets a call. <laughs> he's reading Time is Money, the book. Time is Money. Yeah, right, right. Time, Time is, is money. money and God is That's dumb. This is a good yeah. book unless my life changes a lot and I learn about God. <laughs> he might as well close that book and be like, just like I thought, I knew everything before I read it. Yeah, right. Now, back to my book, <laughs> Karate for Black Belts. <laughs> <laughs> So, but he gets he gets this call from his lawyer saying, "Hey, the cops have dropped all the charges against you as long as you're willing to attend anger management class." Fuck you! I'm not attending anger man. Okay, no, I see what happened. <laughs> Fuck, I see what happened. I heard it. I heard it. I I, I have attended court ordered uh, anger management classes. Just take the felonies, bro. It's it's not <laughs> it's not worth it. So just a bunch of fucking wife beaters, and you're not allowed to tell them what you think of them. It's just it's really it's very very difficult. So, yeah, but he's he goes, as your attorney, I would suggest you take the deal. And he's like, well, then you're fired. And I'm like, well, dude, you're bad at having an attorney. <laughs> well, because he, he says you're fired. He hangs up on him. And then he says, I hate how all these attorneys keep with air quotes advising me. Yes. <laughs> Because like there's look very often Andrew will say, well, you know, I would suggest you do this. And we're like, OK, but well, we're not going to do that. Right. No. So what happens if we do this? You Ooh. don't just fire him at that point. Ooh, maybe we should try that. Just next time Andrew doesn't let me like give out a Supreme Court justice's home address. I'll just be yeah, like, yeah. You're... <laughs> stop advising me. <laughs> so. so, yeah. And, and then just then he gets a phone call from Dr. Redhead earlier in the movie, right? And she's like, I have some test results to go over with you. And he's like, oh, I don't uh, just would tell me over the phone. And she's like, I'd really like to tell you in person. She's like, tell me over the phone. And she's like, okay, fine. You have fucking ball cancer. Now you wish you would come in, you don't you? ball cancer. <laughs> <laughs> conversation. And then she's like, oh, by the way, it yeah, testicular cancer. Um, If you're wondering about the passivity level of it, it's uh, aggressive. So it's aggressive. It knows two types of testicular martial arts. This <laughs> testicular cancer actually needs to go to anger management, technically. <laughs> so the, the precept for this movie is that while he was at the ER, right, uh -huh. for the police brutality, they also screened him for testicular cancer, you know, <laughs> just in case. While we've got him here, we should probably check his balls. Maybe it's because they're like, wow, he has literal balls of steel. This with this warrants further investigation. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do testicle control and I couldn't get anything happening. We had to go to risk. <laughs> this guy is a master of, I would imagine, two or more martial arts. And <laughs> At least. Th those balls are crazy. Let's check that. They heard the police saying the balls on that guy as they were leaving. And they were like, we should check out his yeah. balls. We should check his balls. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Tom needs a minute to process this. So we're going to take a quick break. But first, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will marauding invaders murder his servants and abscond with his livestock? Will a house collapse and kill his entire family? Then how the fuck does he get off comparing himself to Job? <laughs> Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the slight drizzle of conclusion they gave us in I Can't Breathe. Nothing happens. They try no, to do a God thing and they out. get almost to it and it's done. It's just done. It's just, it's sex that ends with a handshake. It's just. <laughs> hey, hello. Hi, Mr. Loresca. Speaking. Yes, I'm Dr. Rogers from the oncology lab down at the hospital. I have your test results here, and I would love it if you could come in to discuss them. Mm, yeah, kind of a busy week for me. Can you just tell me what you have to say over the phone? Well, uh, yes, sir, I, I, I can, but. I, we find that these conversations are usually better in person uh, so we can, you know, discuss all the options. Yeah, I don't know what any of that means. Actually, even better, why don't you tweet them at me? Can you tweet okay. me? Uh, so, Mr. Loresca, I'm calling from the oncology lab. Uh, maybe this isn't something that you want me to uh, to tweet at you. Obviously. Okay, I'll tell you what. I have my family here for Thanksgiving, and we're actually all sitting around the table, and I'm so forgetful, so I'll just put you on speakerphone, and you can tell us all at the same time. No, you said, no, Mr. Loresca, you don't okay. want... Okay, all right, you're on speaker. Everybody say hi to the doctor from the Oncology Lab. Hi, hi. hi. Hey. Oh, okay, uh, Mr. Loresca, you have testicular cancer, and we're going to have to chop off at least one of your balls. Oh, um, why did you test me for testicular cancer when I was in the ER? Uh, actually, funny story on that. One of your nurses uh, is a uh, is a pervert. He's a pervert. Makes sense. Was it Nurse Steve? I'm on the phone. It was Steve. Yes. Ha! See, typical Steve. <laughs> And we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action this time with Officer Murder hanging out at the bar, watching the game with his buddies, right? And this is where Tom comes in to give him a what for? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tom's going to beat up the cops now, according to himself in his own movie. And one of the side cops stops him. He like walks up, he sees this happening and he's like, dude, 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 dude. really sorry about framing you, but like. Now you're actually guilty of attempted assault. Yeah, cops. right. You, you right. Know, this is the you know thing. How it works, right? We accused you of. Yeah. Well, this is literally a. And it took three guys to hold me back. Scene in the movie that he wrote. Mm -hmm. Right. I was really hoping we were going to get to see some of his martial arts skills at this point. No. But... Where he stops halfway through and he's like switching to jujitsu. Here we go. I know too. <laughs> <laughs> now capoeira. Drunken boxing. <laughs> you guys have to sing it. Kung fu is not my major martial art. Switch dance. Yeah, I am not <laughs> left-handed. Yeah, right. So yeah, so he gets dragged out of the bar and he doesn't get to beat him up, even though he probably could have if they hadn't drug him away. Yeah, he totally would have. And then we get him back in his office and he's like, you know, every man has his breaking point and this was mine. And this actor goes for breaking point <laughs> and it's beautiful listener we don't often <laughs> include clips in this show but you have to hear this actor's so attempt good. at reaching his breaking point here it is in all its glory they say every man has his breaking point and this was mine <laughs> i was never going to find justice <laughs> So fucking good. <laughs> and he so. does he does the sweeping all the stuff <laughs> off his desk yes, yes, as part of the moment when he screams and honestly th for me that means like a sex thing now yeah like, right, it felt like he was gonna yes. get up on the desk and like masturbate <laughs> <laughs> fuck himself yeah exactly so yeah so but now broke felonious and cancerous he heads home to new york we see, like, before he's arrived, he's got, like, his dad talking to Uncle Ralph, a character we haven't met yet, explaining to him where we are in the movie. Yes. Telling us shit that we already know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> According to the narrator just now, I'm just going to repeat what he said. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's also very important that dad turns to Uncle Frank or whoever and says, hey, don't start a fight about him attacking the cops. And Uncle Frank is like, 
Got it. That's important. Yeah, for what's I've heard about everything but dote. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Also, dad floats the theory here that it was all the stress from the wrongful felony charges that gave him the ball cancer. Yeah, that'll happen. That'll happen. You got to do some oh, really? mindful breathing and the cancer goes away. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. But yeah, it kind of revert. It's the opposite of stress, obviously. Yeah. And then Tom shows up and we get <laughs> fucking a hug for mom and a firm handshake for dad. Which means that, like, at some point in this filming, Tom is just standing behind the camera going, no, I wouldn't hug my dad like some kind of gamo. okay? We would shake hands. Yes. My, my dad and I don't hug. My dad and I don't hug. <laughs> Trying to keep this movie realistic. So, Maybe instead you could do some super cool karate for him and he could just, like, nod approvingly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this is, like, the greatest example of best worst for me. We're, like, their house is a Michael's Craft yes. showroom here. Oh. There's a sign on the wall that says, be your own kind of beautiful. <laughs> also, right next to that, that. I saw that first. And then I was like, oh, my God, there's a picture that says faith on the table. Yep. Not like the eating table, like the off to the side show stuff off console table thing. <laughs> so they just have like a big picture of faith at all times. Mm -hmm. And they have a dry erase board that says when you have more than you need, build a longer table not a longer fence in Aww. marker in dry erase marker that they like change up their slogan every once in a while. Right. Cause sometimes that has to say, build the wall. Right. Yeah. I'm sure. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. And so they all sit around for a little family wine, right? They've all got these wine glasses and <laughs> uncle Ralph is summarizing all his Joe Blake tribulations. Now he's going to start the fight that dad just told him not to start instantly. Right. Instantly. That's his first action. They sit down and he's like, right. So I'm here to start a fight. I hear you're a cop fighting loser, loser, <laughs> fighter, cop fight. I heard you don't even know two types of martial arts. Slapping your ball cancer. <laughs> I'm slapping it right now. I'm slapping your ball cancer. You can't do anything. Right. And again, like not to get too Finnegan's wake about this fucking movie, but I always have to think of it as like, OK, this is the movie the crazy person wrote about the thing that happened later. So to me, this is a reflection of like Uncle Ralph was like, so I hear your year's been hard. And he was like, fuck you, Uncle Ralph. Yeah. Katas at dawn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing my size. Yeah. So it, it, but. What this is supposed to represent, I think, and maybe I'm overestimating this writer, is the terrible friends that show up at Job's house and tell him he must have done something to have this coming, right? Because he talks about how, like, this must be karma paying Tom back for something. Right. And you remember in Job, when Job, uh, they're all talking, and then he, he really slowly, dramatically stands up from the table, and then nothing happens. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> that's what he, that's what Tom does here. He's like all mad and he's like <clears throat> slaps the table, slowly stands up, glaring at everybody. <laughs> and nothing happens. And they're all like, oh, I thought you were going to. And then he's just standing there. Thought you were going to do a big thing. And Ralph tries. Good old Ralph. He's like, I'm sorry for suggesting that you deserve ball cancer. Like I am, you know. <laughs> and then he's like, no, I'm storming out. And he's like, well, I, what? I It was just a toast. I was just trying to do a toast. We I said, I'm storming out. I'm already gone. <laughs> to be fair, you fought the cops and deserve ball cancer is a pretty Jewish toast. Okay. <laughs> So, and I, of course, I write in my notes, dude, storming away from tables with your family yelling at you at them is what caused all this trouble to begin with. But okay, if you want to tempt fate again. <laughs> oh my God, how amazing would it be if he goes outside and gets in another fight with God? <laughs> all right, this one's on me. Should have known by, by now. He just grows a tumor out of his head. <laughs> so, so, okay, so now Tom goes down to the basement to sulk and his little brother goes down there. And it's at this point, watching the little brother try to deliver his monologue, it's at this point that I wrote in my notes, it's like these actors were all drafted. Yeah. The young man <laughs> appears to be reading his lines at gunpoint. Yeah. Oh, it's terrible. I love this exchange, too. He goes like, yeah, he says, man, why is Ralph such a... And the brother's like, hey, I'm going to have to cut you off right there, man. We can't get any further into that sentence without the Dove Foundation giving us a ding. So, <laughs> yeah. can't afford that. Do you want those sweet, sweet Kevin Sorbo dollars or not? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, we cut to a waiting room while the VO informs us that he's getting cancer surgery on his balls. Mm hmm Yeah. And so the, the family's out in the waiting room and they're, like, talking to each other. It's like, oh, yeah, so Tom's getting... 
cancer surgery. That's really, shut up, shut up. The narrator's talking. And then yeah. the, the, narrative, <laughs> the narrative comes in and they just move their mouths in like wordy shapes yep. to continue their conversation. And once again, the narrator has nothing to say. He's like, boy, God sure is testing me is the plot of the movie. But at least this is probably better than hell, I guess. <laughs> Cancer. <laughs> So he wakes up from ball surgery. We see the doctor standing over him. He's like, so the good news is that we took one of your balls off. The bad news, though, is that the cancer spread to your stomach and your lungs and you're going to need chemotherapy. Yeah. Also, we should point out that this doctor is played by the guy who's also the writer and director and producer of the movie. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yes. And we can see why he chose not to star in his movie, because he also delivers his lines like... He's about to open a car wash. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got stomach and lung cancer too. Goodbye, I'm a pug of peg of corn. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the actor goes for crying again, but the camera mercifully puts him out of his misery with a quick cut. And then we cut to him getting chemo while another chemo patient right next to him reads from the Bible aloud. I would literally rather get chemo injected directly into my eyeballs than sit there with someone reading the Bible for hours at a time. With, we, even if I didn't have cancer. Yes. Thank I you. would seriously stand up and squeeze her bag until it was out. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. I wrote my notes at this point. I'm like, if I ever find myself in this situation, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to explain why it was reasonable to punch a cancerous old lady in the face during her chemo. <laughs> God. <laughs> The voice, the narrator comes on to say, well, but the good part of the chemo is it really took my mind off my pending felony charges. I'm like, woof. <laughs> that's a rough one. <laughs> but, oh, and of course, that's when he picks up his Bible and, and things start to turn around for him a little bit. This is, I almost went with best, worst, half-ass Bible discovery because he barely flicks this thing open and he's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm into Jesus now or whatever. Yeah, right. It's the only way Kevin Sorbo would do the movie. A lot of these pages have numbers. God gives me life. That's it. <laughs> so, so, okay. So then we cut to dad checking the mail and it turns out he's got some good news for a change. They call Tom downstairs because yes, they make the, the cancer guy sleep upstairs and they're like, we got good news for you. Turns out the testicular cancer was a blessing in disguise. The cops are dropping the charges even if you don't go to anger management. Because you're dying, I guess, is yeah, what they're saying. Right. Do yeah, cops uh -huh. do that? I guess. Okay. So, well, it was all a cover-up to begin with. He, so they were like clearly just looking for Oh, no, yeah. Glasses. No, this is part of the cover-up. Yep. Yeah. And, of course, the voiceover is like, was this good news? No, but I'll play along. I'm like, the fuck it wasn't good news, dude. Come on. You can't convince me this isn't good news for you. But the narrator explains that they've what they've really done here is robbed him of his chance to win the case. Yeah. Anyway, so then his his cancer gets better and he gets a new job. Mm -hmm. God, and then they show him. This is uh, like what it looks like to be winning all of a sudden at life, according to this piece of shit, Tom Loresca. He has himself, in again, in his movie, wearing mm -hmm. a, a, a red blazer with a T-shirt under it and mm -hmm. two separate gold necklaces with Jesus being crucified on them. Yep. I just I wanted somebody to come in and pepper spray him and give him more ball cancer based on that <laughs> outfit alone. Thank you. Dude, you look like a men's rights bellhop. I'm spraying you with pepper spray right now. <laughs> Deserve this. I have to pepper spray you. It's the law. Yeah. And so we get that quick scene and then we get him that night. He's like looking through his box of plot devices and, and, and backstory. Right? He's got a box just marked <laughs> Florida that's all about his wrongful charges. Yeah. And he's in his childhood bedroom, right? Yes. So to be clear, he, he got a new job. So he's been working on Wall Street and living at mom and dad's house this whole time. That's cool. Cool. It's, it's his New York story. City. I get it. I, yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. And then the dad comes in and he's like, dude, are you still obsessed over the cops torturing you to death? And he's like, yeah, believe it or not, dad, I'm not over that yet. If, if you believe that. And then he says, and this is apparently the premise of the fucking film, right? He says, and I quote, Dad, I need to have those cops questioned so people know what death is like. What? <laughs> I'm 
I'm like, take me there, Tom, but he never does. Yeah. I wrote in my notes, is that what the movie is about? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought, yes, I thought like, oh, okay, so now this is way late in the movie, but they got a little bit of time for him to teach about his near-death experience and show us God, but they don't. They never nope. do that. No, they don't. Apparently, this movie is that happening. And dad explains that it'll never work. And the dad's like, you know, look, man, you, I know what you want, but you'll never make a movie about this happening. It would all be too boring. <laughs> what would the ending even be? It would just peter to a close, wouldn't it? Yeah. And and dad's like, his basic point is like, God doesn't want you obsessing about this. You just got to let it go. Yeah. And I love these, these moments because I want there to be like one of these impasse arguments. I want like Tom to be like, Bring, oh, hello, God. I should keep obsessing about this. Great. Uh, God just contradicted what you said God said. So uh, do we tie now? Go fuck yourself. Yeah, right. Well, and then the dad says like, hey, come on, man. Like, you obviously went for the cop's gun, right? You know, you're too fucking martial arts and blah, blah, blah. And, they, and he's like, how dare you accuse me? And the dad says, I know how you get. You know, homicidal. Yes, right. Yeah, you gun grabby. He goes, and then he goes, Well, you're a lot like me. And I'm like, You would have gone for the gun, is what you're telling oh, me. I remember when I was a young man in my prime, I fought so many cops. <laughs> Quite privilege. So, Dad, how many martial arts do you know? Let's all get on the record saying how yeah, many. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but Dad shuffles off all sad and deep, deep, deep in that Florida box. He finds a Bible, the one that he got when he was in prison earlier. And he says, all right, I've decided that I'm going to read this Bible every night for a month and see what happens. And this is one of these stupid fucking moments. We always see these in Christian movies where the guy who is a church going, Christ believing, crucifix wearing guy whose entire fucking childhood home is just filled with Bible quotes and Jesus knickknacks decides to become a Christian. Yep. <laughs> Right. And also he's like everyone who ever starts reading a Bible in a fucking Christian movie. He starts in like Psalms somewhere. Yep. Just right in the middle. Just flipping <laughs> through. OK, Jewish, 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 Jewish. <laughs> Here we go. But yeah, but this is the part where he's like, please, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. It didn't count until now. Now I'm Christian. Right. All right, let me flip back for hating gay people, though. That, the Jewish people have <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. So then sometime later, he's at work when off-duty Santa Claus comes to see him. <laughs> okay. This is supposed to be the CEO of his new training firm where he works, right? Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Fucking Father Time runs the training <laughs> firm. And he walks in, and he has Noah's best worst. Oh, my God. It's a black tie with an insanely long red cross on it. And at the bottom, <laughs> there's like a profile of Jesus's face with the crown of thorns the going crown on. Of thorns. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the big, he's got a big chain across. He's got the big chain on his tie. It's a, it's, a torture murder tie. As yes. a theme. Yes. <laughs> it looks like the cover of Jesus's unpopular rap album. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to find this thing on Amazon. I wanted to buy one for all three of us so we could like wear it at the next live show or whatever. Couldn't find it. I found a disturbing variety of Christian neckties, okay. but I couldn't find this one. No, I went through the exact I literally, same thing. I seriously, I found this tie. There's one on the way for both of you guys. Oh, awesome. I swear to God, I found it on eBay. It took a while. Oh, it took wow. A while. Okay. You were more dedicated than me or on Eli. Root. <laughs> Amazing. So, okay. So, boss comes in wearing this tie and they have some, they talk about fucking stock stuff. Yeah. They're so bad at that. Yeah. <laughs> so boss walks in and he's like, have you gave thought, first of all, weird construction, <laughs> have you gave thought on the new first Boston IPO? Uh, apparently, the, the old IPO was good, but this one is bad. <laughs> 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 and Tom looks down and he gets some crucial market information up to date, you know, like microsecond to microsecond market information from a three ring binder of <laughs> yep. paper that he's printed out. He's Someone in an office that stocks. does not contain a computer. Right. There's no, he's a trader. He's a Wall Street <laughs> trader. Does not have a computer, but he has a printer 
behind him. Oh, interesting. With a ream of paper and a three ring binder with all the up to date info. Amazing. Yeah. And then, of course, the boss notices the Bible on his desk at this point. And he's like, oh, you read the Bible. And Tom goes, yeah, I've read a bit of it. You know, just just a tip just to see how it feels. Do you read it? And the boss is like, no, I wear a crucifix tie <laughs> for the fashion statement, man. And tomorrow I could come in in a Muslim tie. You don't know. Yes, I fucking read it. <laughs> and, and he says, he says, you know, I read the Bible quite a bit when I was when times were tough for me and the Bible worked. Yeah. OK, to be clear, it worked to get him through his divorce. Yeah, yeah. I I feel like you lied about reading the Bible, man. <laughs> no, 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 because look, he was there late at night. He was sitting there and he was like, oh, man, I miss her so much. And he opened up the Bible and he was like, shit, I would have been stoned to death a couple thousand years ago. I guess losing the kids and my cat ain't so bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so Thanks, bad. Thanks, Bible. Let me get some new ties. Yeah. <laughs> I am father time. And I do have a little bit of money left over for a sweet tie. And then he goes to leave. The boss goes to leave. And he's like, hey, if you ever need anything, now that I know you share my religion, I'll be nicer to you, right? And I'll help you more in, in terms of your career. And he says, yeah, well, no, of course you will. Do you think you could help me find an apartment, you know, here in Manhattan? And he's like, you know, I know just the person. And I really, it's like, there are four minutes left in this movie, right? Listen, you could be best friends with every single God in history. You're not finding an apartment <laughs> Very right. easily. Thank you. Thank you. But like I said, there are four minutes left in this fucking movie. It is insane to leave, to like introduce a new character at this point. But <laughs> what we learn at this point is that this is how he met his, his wife. Yeah. And she was going to be real mad if he left her out of the movie. Yeah. He very clearly <laughs> handed her the script for this movie, which ended one page ago. And she was like, and you're going to include how you met me, right? And how much we love each other. And he was like, of course. <laughs> of course I'm going to have that. That's the most important The scene. most important I was just... scene of all. <laughs> it's so problematic. They met while she was his realtor. And then like yes! a day later went on a date. It's gross. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, because there's this whole big thing where he's like, you know, hey, would you like to go out on a date with me, person who has to be nice to me, otherwise they might not get this commission, and she's like, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I have questions about this moment where they go to see the apartment. Mm -hmm. Sure, I do too, I do too. So the first thing that happens is he points out that there's a giant water damage hole in the ceiling, mm -hmm. and she says... Oh, if you don't like the hole in the ceiling, we could fix it. And I wrote in my notes, yeah, no, that would be great. I would love yeah. for you to fix all the water damage. No, holes. it's good. It's good. I flagged that. Uh, write it down. I don't like hole in ceiling. You don't. A circle don't. Perfect. Uh, my question is, why is he renting an apartment inside a badly funded public school in the suburbs, but also right near Wall Street in Manhattan? I, well, why? Why does this barren apartment still have a poster on the wall? That says, I couldn't tell what it said, but then the wife says about it, she goes, rubies are gold, my mom used to say. <laughs> yeah. She was an idiot. Yeah, the, the, poster, <laughs> the poster says, she's more precious than rubies. That's the only thing in the entire apartment. We're looking at this giant thing and he's like, yeah, uh, question for you. Yeah, you, you wrote down the thing about the ceiling hole that I don't want. Great. Second question. What the fuck is this? And yes. she explains that this sign is from Proverbs 31. Right. Something about rubies and gold. She's Christian too. And that means that they can date. And so now what's going on here? And this is so like, normally I would just let the mystery linger, but it's so fucking stupid that I have to point it out. What's going on here is that he's interested in purchasing, like potentially like investing in the renovation of a building and he wants to rent an apartment in said building. And that is going to be like the way that the two of them actually met. But he's such a stupid fucking writer that he doesn't realize that he could just have her showing him an apartment and leave that part out. Right. Because there's a part of him that's like, but that's not how we met. Right. right. That's why it's so stupid and needlessly confusing in this moment. So, OK, so we're about to wrap up. But first we have to we, obviously we have to tie off that. That thread with Uncle Ralph. You what remember him? What the fuck's happening with Uncle Ralph? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh... 
I was shaking over here. <laughs> I'm worried that people might not know that Uncle Ralph agreed eventually that that was my fault, that it was his fault yes. for bringing it up during a perfectly nice <laughs> wine having. Mm-hmm. Yes, it was so tough. And then there's this weird moment, which I can only imagine is a transcription of their terrible relationship where he's like, all right, well, you're moving out. And he's like, why are you going to miss me? And his uncle's like, no, I will not miss you. I will not (laughs) miss you. (laughs) And that is the end of the scene. No, yeah. He just says, I don't like change is all. It's not that I like you. (laughs) Also, I'm fucking a lady. I've had sex with a woman and there's another I'm going to probably tomorrow. No, her. He actually says, I'm in a relationship. He just the, he just met this realtor who's be he thinks strippers and realtors like him for real right yeah and he's uh-huh. in a relationship it's it's a lease relationship if you want to be technical but yeah I'm, le- I'm leasing a relationship and then okay so then we cut to the real estate lady she's getting his credit report and she's realizing that his credit isn't good enough for this Manhattan apartment. Right. And her friend at work is giving her the this information and says, ooh, he could you could be his love interest in the movie. And she's like, yeah, no, I was thinking the same thing, actually, even though I'm very clearly 20 years older than the actor playing. <laughs> yeah. You should definitely date the credit risk eye banker that you met <laughs> yesterday while working. That's perfect. Yes. Yeah. And so she calls him and she's like, hey, you know, I just got your credit report back and he's like right right about that don't answer yet don't answer yet (laughs) he actually says that cops gave me ball cancer cops (laughs) cops gave me ball cancer (laughs) that's why my credit's bad is because of the ball cancer that the cops gave me would you like to go out for lunch with me before you say no to my loan let's have sex does that change your answer (laughs) what (laughs) i mean look i'm not saying heath hasn't watched this porn before but Heath has watched this porn okay, before. Okay, we've all watched this <laughs> porn before. Mm, liars. That's that's like this is like a trope. This is like by a porn one hundred and one. Come on, right? Yeah, yeah. This is John Everyman porn. <laughs> so then we got John Every Grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> so then we got to their date, which is in a diner because he's a big spender. And this, by the way, will be the movie's final scene. Yep. It's insane how abruptly this is. So fucking nuts. And we cut to him like he's apparently just told the entire movie to her. Right. Mm -hmm. And she's like, wow, that was very interesting. It would make a good movie. He's like, right. Wouldn't it, though? What an interesting story. I believe you. Yeah. Also, I'm very attracted. to This is a great lunch date you're taking me on at this Denny's with. with, Okay, (laughs) it's a diner. It's not Denny's. I think it's just a regular diner. It's a diner that has. Empty plates out on the table, like place settings right. ready on mm-hmm. like tablecloths. They're going to just bring you the food in their hands and set it there. I don't know. <laughs> look, look, let's just be real. If there French are fries, there you go. <laughs> if there are red plastic cups at your first date and you're an adult, it's not going to work out. No, not probably gonna not okay. going to not going to work out. But he explains that all of this has just been God testing him because how would you know? How would you even know you have faith until Something goes wrong and, sh- and and she's just like, well, you would just, you know, if you believe in God, that counts. It's like, fuck, that you fucks up my whole thing. We won't go back and answer again. She's like, I will. And he's like, no, no, wait, I got it. I got it. I, I would like to drag these goalposts to a slightly weirder position. <laughs> Here's what would I would like to be the like second to last line of the film. <laughs> if those officers don't admit the truth that they framed me for trying to fight them and then pants me and pepper sprayed me in the face until I died and then I came back to life. <laughs> People won't believe in God. What the fuck is that? What did she says? What do you want from all this? And he said, I want people to know what death is like. I need to explain the problem of evil against white people or else no one will ever believe in God. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Look, unless you're about to revenge murder a room full of people, I want you to know what death is like is not a good, that's not the right line (laughs) in that moment. And then the voice, the narrator cuts in and he's like, we sat in that diner all day because fuck our fucking server. Fuck our server right (laughs) in her ass. Seriously, get the fuck out. (laughs) Go to a park, you assholes. New York City has such good parks. 
Oh my, so much, so many plates got spilled on them. Like, oh my right. God, another. I can't believe this loose <laughs> sauce the whole pasta soup. I just time. threw it out of your face by accident when I tripped. I made a mini catapult of hot apple pie and fired it at you? So weird. Uh, that was just a hot coal. Who ordered that? Yeah. And then, and then the movie ends. <laughs> That's, That's the end. end. There's no resolution. There's no point. They're just he's just again that we had a very lovely date. The end. <laughs> and then I met my wife, who I love very much. <laughs> and no, this is not the PS. But but the movie may have ended. Our experience with it does not end quite yet because we still have Eli's best worst. Right. The instant the credits start rolling, we cut in with this interview where Kevin Sorbo is going to interview real life Tom and real life Katarina. And his opening fucking words in this interview are, quote, incredibly powerful movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> right away. Great That's movie. It's weird mean, for the powerful? movie to end with one of we the actors in the movie telling us how good it was. I feel like more should do that. I, if like Steven Spielberg... <laughs> Just popped up at the end of the Fableman. So was like, good. How about that shit, right? <laughs> I fucking rock at making movies, you guys. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck, I'm good. <laughs> so, Jesus. And Kevin Sorbo goes, so why did it take you 20 years to get this story out there? And he's like, well, you know, we had to wait until people would... Uh, would conflate my ordeal with George Floyd so we could trick them into watching it. He's like, right, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you got to time it right. Yeah, he's like, I tried to write a book. I made, I tried to make the movie. I wrote so many emails. And there's it's just this tiny moment where <laughs> Kevin Sorbo's like, yeah, no, I, I got your emails. They, um, and the guy's like, yeah, I bet they bothered you. And he was like, no, no, no. Not first no. 87 yeah, <laughs> there's this great moment where he tries to justify. He's like, you know, so why did the cops do all of this? And he's like, well, you know, they told me to get on my hands and knees. And this is actually his his excuse. I don't believe in getting on my hands and knees for anybody but God. OK, now <laughs> I want to pepper spray you. I'm yeah. fully on the cop well, side. OK, to be yes, to be clear, he just admitted he did resist arrest physically right. and fight cops. Yep. This guy is 100% shot in the face already if he's a black guy. 100%. Yes. Yep. They don't realize that that's the important context. He made it through his entire movie telling his side of the story and made it four seconds into an interview with himself before he was like, I fought the cops. That's why nobody <laughs> said that. I just... <laughs> I got in a fist fight with some cops. And his, his wife's attempt at human speech is intriguing, right? So Kevin Sorbo kicks it to her for a minute. And she said, I have to give you this quote in its entirety. It's, I can't do it justice otherwise. Quote, she says, he says, you know, how did you get involved and what part did you play in this? She says, quote, I love law and I love to investigate every detail. So why did it happen and why we should actually pursue it? So I went through the whole entire case and I see everything that we can actually make it together to practically put justice. What? End quotes. She's like an AI before you tweak it. <laughs> <laughs> like Melania GPT. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and K Sorb says at this point too because they have to you know all lives matter this a little bit Kevin Sorbo says well you can't you know nothing like this would ever happen today right you know like for the modern day police wouldn't be so so bad at their jobs yeah you had to really dig back like 20 years for an incident where cops were unfair to a person and you found a white guy right yeah, yeah. And he's like, you know, and, and Tom is like the real life. Tom is like, yep, I lost everything. I have no money. I'm absolutely broke. By the way, I will offer a hundred thousand dollars for any of those cops that talk, that admit that they did, that they framed me. Like, where, where are you getting that from, man? Yeah. <laughs> he explains that he'll take another lie detector test. Yeah, he says, I took a lie Which detector test meaningless. and I passed it. That's slightly more accurate than getting a tarot card reading that exonerates me. <laughs> yeah. so. This is my favorite part, and it's the very last thing. He finishes that very serious thing, and Kevin Serbo, consummate professional that he is, wants to end things on, an, on a high note. So he goes like, great, tons of fun. All right, well, my Uber's here. <laughs> Turn off the camera. <laughs> All right. So I'll tell you what, we had some fun with this last week. So I'm going to ask you again this week. If you're in charge of the marketing, what is this movie's tagline? 
Ooh, how about I can't breathe or read the room? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can't breathe. Uh, oh, wait. Yes, I can. Because the cops did not shoot me because I'm a white guy. So, yeah. Yeah. But but my throat was really scratchy for a Super while. scratchy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was just going to go with I can't breathe. All lives do matter, though. They do. <laughs> Are you saying they don't? And well, that's going to do it, I guess, for our review of I Can't Breathe. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to do another cycle in this revolving door. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, I don't know if you remember, but a few months ago, I said that we were on the final movie of the Happy Science Cult. <laughs> and luckily, one of our heroic listeners introduced me to the other seven Happy Science Cult oh, no! animes <laughs> that we have yet That's to like watch. That's like 68 hours of film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we'll be watching Hermes, Winds of Love, oh, the story good. of the time that El Cantare was Hermes. Was George Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> Not George Floyd. <laughs> all right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 387 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. I too, can too say words with my mouth. You can also help us a ton by leaving a five-star review and sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Data, DMD Minus, and The Skeptic Ride, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of the Drafts on Mars. All the other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright, Neil Abbasdick, I'm an illusionist. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. Kevin Sorbo went on to finance the movie about a devout Christian who got his private train line nationalized by Adolf Hitler, and he got paid <laughs> slightly below market value. It was a very large injustice. Job got new kids at the end of the story, so Tom's still waiting on news about his testicle. <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled for Tom's next movie, The Towers Have Fallen. That time a kid knocked over my blocks in preschool. <laughs> I'm well trained in zero types of martial arts. I just want to throw that in there. Zero. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023.